good day for everybody who has joined in um, to the Faculty of Graduate Studies, uh, another guest lecture. And it's really a pleasure for me to um, introduce uh, Professor Jagat Rajapaksa from School of Computer Science and Engineering, who is a professor of uh, computer engineering from the Nanyang um, Technological University, Singapore. Uh, it's a big uh, thank you for taking your time um, to um, speak to our research students. Actually, we consider these as some like um, guidance um, presentations, um, enabling them to see a wider, wider world. One interesting um, and important um, fact is that he was recently cited as uh, ranked among the top 2% of um, scientists globally in a Stanford University study. And I must say that our Professor Priyan Dias, who is right now here with us, uh, so also the same study was in that same 2% category. So, um, and uh, he started his uh, BSc, with this BSc in um, electrical um, and um, engineering uh, from University of Moratua, uh, then has moved on to um, many places as a visiting professor in biological engineering at MIT, and then also visiting scientists at the Max Planck Germany and also the National Institute of Health, uh, Mental Health in USA. So you can see um, he's uh, amply capable of talking about or speaking to us about navigating research interfaces. So it's a pleasure. Uh, over to you, Jagat. It's a really pleasure to um, meet one of my classmates and the batchmates at Monitor. And it's a pleasure to introduce you. So over to you, Jagat. Uh, thank you, Ajit. Um... Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, when I was invited uh, uh, by Professor Dilika Dias and uh, Professor Ajit Alvis uh, to give this talk, I asked what kind of talk I should give. And they told me that uh, you share your experience and just give some uh, directions from the areas that you are working to inspire uh, the graduate students and young scientists. So when I look at uh, my work, uh, I mostly work at the interfaces between computer science, uh, medicine, and biology. Uh, now they are called uh, multidisciplinary research. So the research is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. Actually, if you look at the established fields, uh, because they're established, that means most of the research have been done. So uh, the research questions are actually at the boundaries. So this uh, picture on the left uh, tells about uh, the areas I'm working. So uh, one of the areas I'm working is uh, brain imaging. Uh, I, I'm looking at uh, brain function and disease through various imaging modality, MRI, functional MRI, PET, uh, CT, and, and uh, several kind of uh, modalities. So if you look at function MRI, it's taken when you are doing a particular cognitive task. So you can see the uh, different brain regions are lighting up. So these regions actually functions and they interact. So we can form a network of brain regions. We call it a connectome. So our recent work is about analysis of connectome. But these networks are pervasive in biology and medicine. If you look at the computational systems biology, we, we work with the genes, proteins, and they also form networks. Genes don't work alone. They interact with other genes and, and they form a networks and they, they work as a, a system. So, um, so I'm going to talk, uh, show you some highlights of our research. First, um, uh, so this is my agenda. First, I'll uh, sh uh, tell you about my journey, you know, how I get into this uh, biology and medicine. Uh, and then I'll share some uh, my experience and then give some advice to the students who uh, want to work in the in, at the interfaces, you know, interdisciplinary research. Uh, and then I'll move into uh, the areas I'm working. I'm working in three areas. I, might, I have three research groups, basically. Uh, one working on brain imaging research, 
the other group working on computational and systems biology, the other group working at the uh, deep learning research. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the research, uh, the science is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. The important and interesting questions, uh, uh, research questions are at the interfaces. So if you look at uh, my work, uh, I work in these three fields, the boundaries of the three fields, three fields, computer science, uh, medicine, and biology. So the computer science and medicine, I mainly work with the brain research. Uh, how can we look at the brain? Because in the brain, still we know how it functions, the pieces of the story. We don't know the complete uh, story about the brain, how it functions. Uh, and, uh, and even the brain diseases, the, the, the medicines are not very targeted because it's a very complex object. We have billions of uh, neurons and trillions of connections. So you cannot pinpoint specific targets in the brain. So it's, it's, it's a quite open for research. So uh, brain imaging, uh, the ultimate goal is uh, to have a brain test, like a blood test, you know. You take different scans and then it will tell you about your, your brain functioning and, and any abnormalities. In the biology, uh, I, I work with the life sciences data. Life sciences data means the molecular data, molecular biology data, like genes, proteins, different molecules in the cells. So how uh, the data about uh, those uh, uh, molecules, and, and then you analyze this data. Now you can gather this data. They're called omics data. You can get genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics. There are various types of uh, omics data. So how to look at, I mean, you, you can gather this data, then how you can make inferences about underlying biological phenomena. So that's about computational systems biology. So, uh, so I, I am an expert in machine learning or computation scientist. So the machine learning, with the machine learning, I, can, I am able to look at the data producing medical domain as well as biological domain. So the people working in medicine and biology, if they gather their data, they need help from the computer scientists to look at this data to uh, mine this data and give uh, important uh, conclusions or make inferences about the data. So machine learning uh, brought me into those fields and uh, my work is uh, mainly at the interfaces. Okay, so uh, I consider myself as a computation scientist. Uh, that means you develop a computational techniques and algorithms to build intelligent machines to solve day-to-day -day real world problems. So now actually uh, this area uh, can, uh, I mean, are defined as data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, computation, so different names, but they all are related. So they all trying to build models to uh, build intelligence and machines to solve this, uh, you know, lot of problems. So, uh, so I, I consider myself as a computational scientist, but my major area is one is a brain image. Look at the brain images. Uh, and uh, there are so many modalities and different modalities gives different informations, uh, CT, MRI, functional MRI, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, and PET imaging. So the, uh, uh, so you, you need, uh, so the technological part is developing, the scanner technology, and, and to uh, get something meaningful out of these brain images, you need a lot of algorithms and software uh, to uh, make inferences. 
And then I work on computation and systems biology. Sometimes this is referred to as bioinformatics. So in, uh, in systems and computation biology is to use the machine learning algorithm to analyze life sciences data. Now, today is the life sciences data coming as various omics data, genomics, DNA, uh, and transcriptomics, gene expression data, proteomics, about proteins in a cell. So all these uh, uh, omics data, uh, I mean, computational biology means you look at one molecule at a time, one protein at a time, one gene at a time. Systems biology means you look at collection of proteins, how they interact as a system. So uh, networks of uh, genes, networks of proteins. So that's called a systems biology. So I, 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 I work uh, uh, in, in computation systems biology problems. Uh, so these are the three areas I'm working at. So in the, as a computation algorithm, now I'm working on mainly deep learning because there's a uh, resurgence of a neural network, deep neural network, and a lot of applications are coming up. So before I uh, proceed, I, I just like to uh, show you how I get into this uh, different uh, fields, mainly how I get into uh, biology and medicine. Uh, I started my uh, higher education at uh, University of Moratua. I was an undergraduate in electronics and telecommunication department. And my uh, final year project, uh, I mean, as a research project I consider, uh, it was uh, building uh, electronic circuits for a transmitter and, and a receiver. So, so I was building uh, ele uh, electronic circuits. So at the same time, there was back propagation algorithm was invented, 1986. Now the back propagation algorithm is the algorithm that enable to learn big neural networks. Because before that, there was no algorithm to learn networks of neurons. We could, early algorithm was able to learn only a single neuron, only, only a few neurons. So that was, uh, a, a very big finding in the neural network research, artificial neural network research. So when I joined the University of Buffalo, uh, the electrical and computer engineering department, and my professor was working on computer vision problems. So he wants to apply the neural network, the new neural network, the back propagation algorithm to solve computer vision problems. So I started my work on neural networks when I was a graduate student. And then uh, after graduation, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was offered a position at NIH. Uh, that's the biggest uh, med health research institute in USA. Uh, instead of uh, branch is uh, mental health uh, to uh, analyze anatomical MRI images, because I had this uh, brain background, uh, and then I had the background to analyze uh, images. So I started, uh, I, I was uh, attached to a psychiatric department. So they were looking at what are the difference of the brains of healthy subjects and psychiatric patients, like schizophrenia, ADHD. And they found that the sum structure, the size, of these structures are different from psychiatric patients and normal patients. But I was a computer scientist developing image analysis and brain segmentation algorithm. So at the same time, the functional MRI was invented. So functional MRI is different from anatomical MRI. In anatomical MRI, that's a normal MRI that you normally talk about. The functional MRI, you see where the brain is acting. So functional MRI's image is taken when you are working, uh, doing a task, when you are doing a task. So, so you can see the brain lighting up. So then I, I, I joined uh, Max Planck Institute of Germany uh, to analyze functional MRI. So at that time, basically how to 
process this fMRI. So my work was very fundamental because it's a, it was a very new modality and people didn't know how to handle that, how to pro process this data. So thereafter, I wanted to uh, join a faculty, university faculty. So then I uh, joined uh, uh, NTU in Singapore. Then I started uh, uh, teaching uh, neural networks because I, I started uh, neural networks for uh, the final year students. And then uh, in the 2002, there was a human genome project was uh, completed. So that was the first time that DNA molecules were sequenced. First human DNA was sequenced. So it was an effort from different countries. They, they, they sequenced the genome. But today, uh, you can have your a, a, a genome sequence for about thousand dollars or hundred dollars that up can but at that time that was the first genome sequenced so the singapore government is very forward looking uh, government they they look at 10 years ahead so they thought that this is a, a, a good uh, discovery and they invested a lot in life sciences so if you come to Singapore now, you can see there's a biopolis. That area is a lot of institute doing life sciences research. And a lot of companies, drug companies have their branches there. So they invested. So they wanted to ask in the university to start a bioinformatics program. We started a master's program in bioinformatics. So there, then I started learning computational biology and also teaching computational biology. So I. I, I first shared my course with the uh, expert in, in that area. So, um, and then uh, I was continuing, and then the deep learning, the resurgence of neural network, because the neural network field was silenced sometime. And then the deep learning uh, invention, that's the AlexNet, uh, they, they build a deep, uh, neural networks with many, many layers. We call them deep neural networks because earlier we had only shallow networks, maybe two or three layers, because the computational power was not enough. But today we have processors, GPUs, which can run deep neural networks. In 2012, a group from uh, uh, University of Toronto showed that you can have the object recognition as good as human recognition. So the whole, field, the deep learning field exploded. So, uh, so, so then uh, I, I, I started moving to uh, deep learning. So uh, I, the, the research career is not uh, planned. Uh, it was guided by scientific discovery. So, uh, so as a scientist, uh, I mean, as a researcher, young researchers, uh, I, I, I advise that you have to be open and look for the important discoveries and you align your research with those discoveries. So today I, I teach two courses. Uh, now my course is called uh, Neural Networks and Deep Learning because there is a deep learning part in the, in the course. And also I offer a graduate course which is called Computation and Systems Biology. It started as a computation biology course, but now we talk about systems of uh, biomolecules. So my advice for you know, young researchers, look for new scientific discoveries and align your research and be open to uh, move to those uh, uh, important discoveries, not to stick to your comfort zone, but just a little bit open and, and uh, to embark on new research areas. So um, as I mentioned, um, if you're looking for a, a research project, I think you should look at uh, the interfaces. You should look at uh, multidisciplinary research, uh, not uh, uh, at, at the interfaces, because the science is becoming more and more uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, because the important uh, questions and most impactful research happens at the boundaries. So this uh, diagram at the left is called the science map. It's a little bit old uh, diagram. Uh, all the 
a diagram. It's, uh, it's a 2008. I couldn't find a recent diagram. So basically, different colors represent different fields. Uh, and, and they have placed this field, uh, those fields which are cited together in the, in the papers, they have, uh, they have aligned them close to each other. So if you see in 2008, this, this, this area, you know, material science, chemistry, and all are very work together. So that's a multidisciplinary. So that's, that is the time when the nanotechnology came into a uh, picture, very hot area in that time. And the environment science is another interdisciplinary area. But I'm sure that if you look at a figure uh, today, I think the computer science has, uh, you know, has uh, invaded all other fields, have gone into all other fields. So you can see the computer science is interfacing with most of the uh, other fields. So multidisciplinary is a good area to be, uh, and uh, it seems uh, most impactful research uh, happens recently are uh, multidisciplinary. So in, in TU, uh, there is a fund, actually, that fund funds only multidisciplinary research. So you have to have members from other faculties, and, and it, the project has to be multidisciplinary to encourage multidisciplinary research. So uh, there are a few things that you need to remember when you embark on multidisciplinary research. You should be willing to learn you know, new areas and you should be able to open to uh, collaborations because you have to work with others and, and you, have to, you should learn the new jargon. And it's, it's very rewarding because you, 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 you get knowledge from uh, different areas and you, you get an opportunity to work with people with different uh, know-how and different expertise and diverse uh, uh, expertise. And also you should know how to balance your competition and collaboration because when you work with others, you have to balance the competition and, and cooperation. Uh, so before I go into a real research work, uh, I just want to give some uh, uh, hints uh, to uh, uh, students. Uh, I, I strongly encourage students to embrace the technology because there, there are technological advances to embrace the new technology and, 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 and use them for your research. For example, go digital. I still have some students who bring me you know, printed papers and, and, and look at the papers and the printed copies. I always tell them, don't print it, go digital and read them in the computer because that's very effective. And I think it's, uh, you, you need to uh, embrace that. If you come to my room, you don't see any books or any papers in, in my room. I have only the computer and I have a notepad to write my notes. So try to go digital. Uh, and few things I have uh, listed here. Uh, if you are, uh, you are doing experiments in the computer, you always go for, start from already available source codes and you build upon them. Don't try to write the code from scratch. So you can go to the source codes. If you go to the GitHub, you can see the previous because now the people are more and more make their codes available to other researchers because then only the other researchers will cite your work and also take your research forward. So it's becoming very important because as a researcher, now they're not looking at your research work, how impactful that your research is, how much contribution you have made to science. You have to make your work available to others and then they will use it and they will take your work forward. And it's also important how to manage literature because as a researcher, you have to read a lot of papers. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and, and you have to, uh, because there are, with the internet now, the, there is an overload of information. 
and an inflammation of inflation of uh, papers number of papers are huge so you have to uh, organize the literature and filter out the good literature so there are some few tools that i would like to recommend the mendeley is a free tool uh, you can use them to store your uh, papers and 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 mendeley you can interface to your word documents so you can, when you're citing you can use as a reference manager i use a, a package called papers it's a, it's a commercial package you have to pay about 40 dollars per year but it's very handy and it saves a lot of time from me you know how to keep my all the literature organized and how i can use them for uh, when i write the papers and also i encourage you to look at public domain databases they are very big and 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 look at always public domain databases and also when you are doing a collaborative research uh, when you are writing papers there are tools that you know authors can go there and collaboratively write it up you can use overleaf for example if you are looking at latex uh, writing papers and then you can use google doc you can share the papers with others and and they can collaboratively write it and also i encourage you to use a smartphone for communicate research so all my students are in in my uh, phone and whenever i need to discuss something i just call them or we we, we communicate via whatsapp messages so 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 embrace the technology because the technology sometimes uh, initially you know you don't want to go through all the hassle to learn it but once you learn it it will save you a lot of time so so my suggestion to all the students is go digital and embrace the technology and and make use of them and it will in the long run that will save a lot of time and you become very efficient all right so i'm going into a uh, uh, different topics, uh, you know, I'm going into a different research area. Are there any questions or comments at this time? All right, if not, I'll continue. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to show you a few snapshots. I'm not going into the details of this research, uh, but if you need uh, to discuss, you can contact me later or ask me for more information. Uh, but I'm going to show you some snapshots, uh, uh, very recent research that we have done. So uh, the, the first part is on brain imaging. So this work is with Sukrit and Ji Hao. Sukrit graduated, is a PhD student who graduated last year, and he did quite a lot of good work. And Ji Hao is a second year PhD student. He's continuing uh, that line of research now. So we worked about the connectome. Uh, to look at the connectome, the brain network, uh, we are using two kinds of uh, MRI modality. One is called uh, diffusion tensor imaging or DTI. And the other one is called functional MRI. Now the DTI measures the diffusion of water molecules. So the brain regions you have the gray matter where are the neuronal bodies and they are linked with the white matter fibers so with diffusion tensor imaging you can uh, you can uh, track this white matter fibers white matter fibers with the diffusion tensor imaging so basically you are looking at actual physical connections between the brain regions so that you can do with uh, DTI images. And functional MRI images, they are taken while you are doing a certain functions. So you can see over time, every brain voxel, there will be a signal going over the time. So time series between this time series. And then you can find out working together, functionally connected we call functional connectivity. So these two modalities gives you different uh, information about the brain. 
the DTI give you physical connection between the regions and functional MRI give you functional connectivity between the regions. So you can put this into a network brain connector. So this is uh, uh, the DTI. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, every pixel, it will give you the direction of the fiber. So you can track the fibers. So these algorithms are called tractography algorithm. So you can uh, get, uh, you can uh, mark the fibers, you can see individual fibers in the brain. So remember that this, uh, this modality is cannot go to the neuronal level. Neuronal are very, uh, the nanometer level, that level you cannot go. We, we look at the regions, because if you look at different regions, the, the neurons in a particular region are behaving very similarly. So you can uh, similarly and have similar characteristics. So they work together. So we, we use that region as one node in this network and different uh, no, uh, regions are connected by connections. So, uh, so this is a functional MRI or fMRI. So different regions, you get a time series and another region, you get another time series. So the connection, connectivity is given by the correlation between these time series, correlation between the time series. So we can get this network into a connectivity matrix. So from one regions and the other axis also you have the brain region. So between the elements, you have the connectivity strength of the connectivity. So this color coded map is the uh, the different colors will show uh, shows you the strength of the connection. Matrix. So this connectivity matrix is the connector, the uh, computational representation of the connector. So we analyze this connector and 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 try to make. Uh, inferences about the brain function. So uh, the Sukrit works, actually, the first work is about detecting functional modules and hubs. So the brain networks are scale-free networks because most of the natural networks are scale-free. If you look at a power grid network or population grid or social network, or molecular network. Most of these networks are scale-free networks. Scale-free networks means networks whose degree node, nodal degree, number of connections at the nodes behave a power law, the distribution of the nodal degrees. So they, these networks have hubs. That means highly connected nodes. The hubs are highly connected nodes. And then uh, they, they are distantly related, so they are very highly connected hubs. So they are the most important. You have a power hubs where most of the, in the cities, you have very high connectivity. So those are the hubs. And the brain networks also, you have some region which are very important in the communication in, in the brain. Uh, and then these brain nodes are modular. That means the network, we have sub-networks specialized in specific functions. So his, his, my student work, the Socrate work, was to uh, identify, develop algorithms to identify these modules and hubs. So he developed an uh, algorithm to find a different modules of the brain. Uh, it's called iterative consensus spectral clustering algorithm. It's, it's a clustering algorithm. It will, from the connectome, the algorithm will find the module. So after running the algorithm, you can see this uh, uh, connectivity matrix. You can see these uh, uh, squares. They represent actually modules. 
So this uh, regions actually correspond to the language module because you know different regions of the brain and different modules of the brain specialized in different functions. This is the hand motor regions. So different attentional uh, uh, modules. So different modules. That means group of nodes specialized for different. So you can see uh, the color coded are the brain regions belonging to different modules. So his algorithm was able to detect these modules carefully. So uh, we have looked at the literature and uh, this, uh, we have validated that uh, these modules are actually really uh, neuroscientifically uh, correct uh, modularizations. So uh, we found about, uh, I think, 16 or 14 modules in the brain using this algorithm. And also we uh, look at uh, uh, this, uh, this was actually a public domain data set. It's called Human Genome Project. There are about 1,000 uh, uh, subjects in this uh, brain images. These are resting state uh, functional MRI images. So uh, you can, uh, so we, we detect the modules and then we look at how the intersubject variability, because different person have different brains, how they are different in different modules, uh, different uh, brains. So that's called the inter-subject variability. When we look at it, uh, and this, uh, the size of these nodes, actually the regions will tell you the purity. That means they are very stable. If they are big, they are very stable across subjects. And small uh, dots, regions, are very unstable. That means it's different from one person to the other. So variability across subjects is very high. So we have, uh, so we studied the intersubject variability. We found that visual, motor are very stable modules. If you look at the evolution of the human brain, these uh, modules were evolved at a very early stage, a very early stage, and they are very stable. They are very similar in individuals, but other regions like attention, very high cognitive functions, uh, 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 very high cognitive regions are very different from different subjects. Uh, and we have made the code available for this research also. Uh, if some, anyone interested, uh, they, you can have the code and also the data is also public domain data. So it's possible to, uh, take this uh, research forward. Uh, another uh, work, uh, very recent work is uh, identify the hubs. How do you identify the hubs? Uh, we came up with a new uh, degree called ambiver degree, a new measure. So using this measure, you can say whether this node is a hub or not hub or not. So the special thing about this measure is we look at the variability across individuals. If, the, if, the hub, if this node is very stable across that, we give a high uh, score for this, uh, uh, this measure, ambivert degree. So by using ambivert degree, we were able to identify the hubs in the brain, the regions that are very important in the communication of the information processing within the brain. So these, uh, uh, these are the different uh, uh, hubs in different modules. And then we compare are there, how these hubs uh, act in patients and healthy subjects. We, we did analysis in the two groups of patients. Uh, one is the autistic uh, spectrum disorders, autistic subject and healthy subject. And the second group, we look at the Alzheimer patients and healthy subjects. So what are the hubs, how, how these hubs behave? So we found that there are regions, the hubs are different in autistic patients and healthy subjects. So red 
are the hubs where we are a prominent in uh, uh, a, uh, autistic patients and green ones are the hubs uh, highlight uh, important in uh, cognitive normal cn means cognitive normal subjects so these uh, hubs are differently associated with in a, uh, autistic patients and then alzheimer patients and a normal cognitive normal patients the hubs are different these regions are different so these regions can be used as biomarkers if you want to develop a drug so then the drug should target these regions or intervention you know then you can use these regions as the intervention research but we just verify these regions you know validate these regions using the uh, literature neuroscientific literature but someone could take this uh, uh, hubs and and test this in clinically uh, whether this could be targeted by a drugs or intervention uh, another work that we did was the encoding and decoding coding means uh, you take the connectome and and take a small uh, compact representation uh, and and by doing that we can classify a brain into different classes for example encoding we can say that it's it's a disease uh, it's is a patient brain or normal brain or we can have you know in a given a disease we can say at what stage so early dementia late dementia we we try to get a compact representation of uh, uh, of the uh, of the connectome and we can predict make some prediction about uh, what kind of uh, task the uh, person is doing and how much the performance is task performance or drug response and cognitive measures so you can make some predictions from the from the from the brain imaging so you can do the uh, structural connectome from dti images and functional connectome from fmri images decoding means you want to identify the regions which are different in, in different tasks or different diseases what are the brain regions that are different in disease and, and so we we we, we develop algorithm mainly deep learning algorithm to decode and encode the connectome so this paper came up uh, early this year uh, so uh, we we took the connectome and we did the encoding and we tried to classify uh, from the brain whether uh, uh, uh disease classification whether it's a disease brain or not brain i detection of uh, several brain diseases and then we did the decoding uh decoding to identify the brain region so what we did was we build a neural network and then we identify the nodes in the neural network that are not very important for this disease classification that's called feature selection in machine learning you have several features you want to find out which features are the important this is a very hot area of research at uh, in deep neural network today to identify the features that are relevant to your prediction so this is done normally by looking at what is known as the relevancy of a node first do at the output layer and then you feed back to your input layer so this algorithms are called saliency back propagation algorithm and you identify the features that are new what we did was we remove the network remove the all irrelevant nodes irrelevant nodes so we we make it a very linear or very compact neural network so and and then it improves the performance of the neural network and also it make a very simple neural network when you make the neural network simple and small number of parameters it it generalizes uh, to the uh, problem very well okay 
So, um, so we, we did this for disease classification. Uh, we, we look at uh, several diseases. ASD means aut autistic spectrum disorders. AD means Alzheimer's disease. ADHD means uh, uh, ADHD means attention deficit hyperactive disorder. MCI means uh, mild cognitive impairment. MDD means major depression disorder. So these disorders, we were able to classify given a brain, whether it's a diseased brain or healthy brain, the two class classification. So these were the accuracies, original accuracies. But we, using our method of decoding, we remove, we simplify the network. So at the end, so we, we uh, introduced in this paper two kinds of algorithm, lean and clip. By using, we could get into uh, a, a parameter about 1%. We can, we can remove about 90%, 99% of the connections in the neural network and make it very compact. But still the accuracy was uh, very high. Uh, we are not losing accuracy much. Sometimes we got an improvement of the accuracy. So the key is when you remove these uh, features, so what are remaining features are the important features. So they, they are the biomarkers. That means they are the regions that are different from healthy and diseased subjects. So, so we find we not only improve the classification accuracy, but we found the biomarkers or the regions that leads to this uh, identification of these disorders. So this, uh, this is again the connectivity figures after removing that. Uh, you can, these, these are yellow ones are the region connections. So these are different regions of the brain and different regions of brain. So the metrics will tell you the connectivity between the regions. So these yellow regions are the regions but are different in the cognitive normal and Alzheimer's disease patients. And here, these are the regions different from cognitive uh, normal and uh, depressive patients. So we found the regions that are different in healthy subjects and uh, patients with brain disorders. Uh, so, so these uh, regions can be used as biomarkers. All right, so that's uh, about our late uh, recent research in uh, brain imaging. So I'm switching the gears now. So uh, I'm going into a computation and systems biology. We have about five minutes more. Uh, let's see how much I can go. So this work is with uh, Leon, uh, Rama, and Kong Hao. Leon and Rama were two postdocs in my uh, group. Uh, and Kong Hao is a PhD student. Uh, now he's continuing this research. So we are working with the multi-omics data. Uh, different omics data. Uh, computational and systems biology deals with the data gathered at the molecular level. So you take a blood sample or saliva samples and you can run it through with these omics ma machines and you can generate this data. So you can get genomic data. Nowadays you Uh, that's a popular one, but there are other types of omics data, transcriptomics. The transcriptomics means uh, the mRNA in, in your cells. When you have the, the DNA or the genes are very dormant molecules. They are not functionally active molecules. When they are active, they become into mRNA and then convert into protein. Proteins are the active molecules in our bodies. When they become protein, they interact and they do some function. So the cell function, start function. Measure the mRNA levels or the transcript. So we call transcriptomics. You find the mRNA expressions. 
we find the proteomics. You find the proteins in the cells. It's called proteomics. And you have epigenomics. The epigenomics measures the uh, molecules that are modified by the environment because nurture change, make changes to our cell, uh, cell uh, profile. So the epigenomics measure the environmental effects and metabolites, so other, other molecules. So we have omics data, which gives information about that. Now this technology is becoming very cheap and you can afford it, but there are no algorithms or techniques to analyze this data or integrate this data and discover hidden information about this data. So we are now working on analysis of multi-omics data. So mainly we are looking at cancer because the, for cancer, the, some databases are available in public domain. You can look into this multi-omics data. And also we are looking at psychiatric diseases. So this is a, a, a paper that came out recently. Uh, so uh, we used uh, uh, transcriptomics and epigenomics data, combine these two data types in a neural network to predict outcomes of neuroblastoma patients. Neuroblastoma is a brain cancer. So we look at their blood and, and uh, blood response, blood through uh, transcriptomic and uh, epigenomics data through, from blood. And we build a neural, deep neural network to predict the clinical outcomes, whether this patient will survive or not, how long the survival time, how much. So we build this model to predict those parameters. So one of the challenges in the multi-omics data is uh, they are very high dimensional because this So I think I'll, I'll continue for about another five minutes and stop. Uh, I think that we are, yeah, 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 over, we are going. No, no, that's fine, Jagan, that's okay. fine. Okay, so, um, so this work, basically this, what you see is called the protein interaction network. So you can see you have modules like the brain networks, you have modules and you have hubs in this uh, network. So this network will tell the different type of proteins and they interact. So you can see there are modules and these modules are actually correspond to different functions. So this one is an inflammatory response of the cell. It's different functions of the cells. So uh, we developed an algorithm to uh, detect these modules. And we showed that these modules are actually uh, biologically plausible and, and, and biologically relevant modules. So this paper, we, we present this uh, uh, algorithm, how we uh, derive this uh, 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 modules and, and uh, how we uh, make inferences about the uh, modules. the genomics, the omics data. Uh, so in this data set, uh, we have cancer cell lines. That means uh, they have taken you know, cancer real cells and grow in the dish uh, in, in vitro cells. And they have put different drugs into these cells. And, and, and they have looked at the responses. So using this data set, you can build it. So it's an in vivo model, in vitro model, but 
after building the model, you can use it for real tumors, cancer tumors, and see whether this drug, how this drug responds. Because the cancer, one of the problems is it's very heterogeneous. Different treatments, different drugs works for different persons. But now we are going into a personalized medicine, personalized medicine. So you can, we can see that we measure all this genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics from the cell, and as well as we have the chemical structure of the drugs. So all this uh, data will give you features to build machine learning techniques. So we have built a neural networks and the main feature of this uh, architecture is we had an attention layer. Attention layer means when they are fusing, normally people will either concatenate these embeddings from different uh, uh, networks and just combine or just multiply these uh, uh, different uh, embeddings. Rather, you can use attention layer. The attention layer is a, is a region mechanism. When you combine multiple vectors, you can see you know, which elements are corresponding or interacting with each other, then you can weigh this element differently so that the fusion, uh, uh, you can do a meaningful fusion uh, for this one. So, uh, so we, we developed the techniques uh, to, pre uh, to predict drug response and uh, we have validated this technique. And I think the future depends on how do you translate this in vitro models into a real, a real uh, human tumors. Then you can see from the patient, given patients, all this omics data, you can say whether the drug is going to work or not. The other thing is that we are planning to do is the interactions between the omics features and the drug chemical features. Because a drug is normally acting on either protein or genes, targeting on genes. So by just by looking at the interactions, uh, looking at the interactions, we can see how the drug uh, drug inter uh, designing novel drugs or novel chemical chemical uh, chemicals for uh, interventions. So I think I'll stop here because uh, I have uh, already gone over time. So uh, uh, I think here, uh, so yeah, sorry, I'll skip this. Yeah, just to uh, summarize uh, what I have done, uh, I just uh, introduced you to multidisciplinary research. If you are looking for a, a topic to research, I think it's good to, uh, look for at the boundaries uh, because uh, most uh, interesting problems, I find it very interesting to work with others with diverse backgrounds. And I presented something uh, brain imaging. Uh, we look at the functional connectome and detecting hubs and modules and how these modules and hubs varies across subjects and varies across different work analysis. Uh, not only, uh, 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 a molecular network, any networks can be analyzed, can be handled with the a network X in Python, Python library. Yeah, I think as a researcher, you have to find the right tools. There are so many tools in the, uh, if you search, uh, you get a lot of tools, but you should know which tool is the best, uh, which tool is, I think you can ask around and, uh, and see what tools is best. So otherwise you, you, you will uh, struggle and waste your time. So uh, it, it's good to talk to your colleagues and, and your, uh, your, your peers and, and find out what tools are the best tools for your research. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I've got direct questions. I can't use them. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, yes. I think they communicate to me directly. Yes. Oh, that's fine. That's, that's fine. fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah.
Yeah, one yes. of the one of the important thing is this dialogue between the researchers themselves. I mean, that's something we lack because we seem to work with, uh, let's say, the student or the supervisor and a lot less networks. Yeah, I think it's good to have research meeting. I mean, uh, meetings because I I have weekly meetings. Uh, I put several students together so they talk among each other because sometimes I'm not up to date about the latest tools, uh, but they they know latest tools. So by talking students among students, they get to know new things. So I put students together to work together and, and I call uh, group meetings. So they, they exchange their ideas. Um, Brian, are you muted or oh, uh, maybe um, let me. Yeah, the connect home research, uh, there's a question for me uh, asking what are the uh, evaluation metrics. I think for a machine learning, uh, there is a Python package called scikit-learn. Uh, if you call the library a metrics from scikit-learn or even TensorFlow, they have a metrics. So all the matrices are there. So you just call the library and you can uh, get all the measures, uh, measurements uh, from uh, this library. So. So I think it's a very important. Uh, the Scikit-Learn is a very good library for machine learning. And if you want to learn deep learning, uh, you should look at uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch libraries. So uh, Python, I, in my group, uh, for machine learning and deep learning work, students use Python mainly. Uh, because I think everything is moving towards Python. Uh, it's, it's, it's an easy language to program. Um, and, and for bioinformatics, the R is R language is the still uh, has most libraries. So uh, you may want to look at R if you are looking at uh, bioinformatics research. Rian, you may. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, this is a question from a civil engineer who happens to have an interest in these kinds of problems. You know, the, in the early days of neural networks, I mean, the, the considered wisdom, the received wisdom that one cannot have more parameters than training examples. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with these deep neural networks, that particular rule seems to have been thrown out of the window. I mean, even Jeffrey Hinton sort of says, <laughs> well, what do you worry about if it, uh, what are you worried about? If it works, it's good. Well, what are your views about that? Because, you know, when you use this, especially deep neural networks, you have large numbers of parameters and often they are greater than the number of training examples. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, you're correct because uh, you can't have uh, uh, more parameters than samples. Uh, what happens is then uh, the network will overfit for your training data and it will lose its ability to... Uh, uh, generalize. It will not work for new data. So it will, it will remember the training data very well, but it will poorly work on uh, test data. But there are several uh, approaches now. One of the strongest uh, cases are dropouts. When you train, you have to use dropouts. In the dropouts, what happens is it will drop out some of the connections randomly during training. So it becomes a very simple network. So you can go up to about 20% of the parameters. You randomly, when you're training, you randomly drop out connections and nodes. So, so it eventually train a small network. So that will handle some of the parameter problems. So with the dropouts, if you if de deploy dropouts, you can have, uh, uh, you, you, you actually train a very small network. So, so that is one technique you can, um, you can use to avoid overfitting. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so that's one technique. And then you can use some regularization techniques uh, to avoid overfitting. Uh, so there are some attempts uh, to handling, but I know some researchers uh, report, uh, uh, report findings for very small data set as well. But I, I think such networks usually overfit to your training data, might not work well with the uh, new data sets. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Right. Uh, I suppose uh, in the absence of any more questions, and I think we have to thank you for your time and uh, being with us for more than one hour and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit, for organizing this. I, I, I... I was just looking at whether Delhi cuts around, but not yet. So, uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And Bye. thank all for participating. Until next one.